thoughts about these steps of conversion, of deeper conversion? How does this sound to people? Does this sound plausible? Does this sound about right? Yeah. So everybody was in a different stage. Yeah. But it doesn't matter, right? I mean, as long as you're... Uh, as long as progress. we're on the move. As long as now we're not... Move. Yeah, move. as long as we're not stuck in one stage. It's a good idea to keep looking forward and going, okay, where, where's God leading me next? But most Catholics are in number A, a letter A. Yeah. I the mean, church is a pact with A, otherwise this room would be packed. Yeah, Sherry Waddell says this, the, the church is packed with A's and B's, mostly A's. And that when she asks priests to estimate in their parish after giving them the presentation, first off, after she gives the presentation, a fair number of priests assert that they are not yet intentional disciples of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then she asks them to discern... Okay, how many people, what percentage of people in your parish would you say are intentional disciples? And she says the number that keeps coming up over and over again is about 5%. There's a huge gap between the potential, everything that God has for us to be as a church and as a community, and where we are now. There's a whole lot of room for growth. In a way, that's really exciting. But... So many people don't know that there is room to grow. So that's where we get to help people move forward. Yeah, and you mentioned, I mean, coming to a point where you realize, okay, I need to start making a decision. That was one thing that made my husband such a good faith role model for me. He nearly died twice before I met him. So he had a very vivid sense of his own mortality. And he, he'd made the decision. Yeah. There's another book that I'm reading right now, and. Um I'm not going to get the words exactly right, but you'll get the idea. It's something like, if you're only thinking about yourself or only inwardly looking, you're going to end up a very shriveled person. Well, I thought, oh boy, that's quite a statement. I mean, some words just jump off the pages. So you're not going to reach any of those if, if you're you know, so self-absorbed. You, you have to have these other things. You know, I've got, a, I've got mixed feelings about that statement. I mean, of course, we're all called to love our neighbor as ourselves. But I'm also reminded of St. Augustine's statement where he prayed, God, help me to know you and help me to know myself. Because you also can't move forward unless you've got some pretty good self-knowledge. It's hard to anyway. I've got a story to tell in just a moment of when I said, not yet, I want to live my own life. But first, let's see, the importance of surrendering to God again and again. It's not a one-time thing. It's not like you suddenly decide to become an intentional disciple. And, yeah, all of a sudden from that point forward, you're walking on air, not hardly. Once we're intentional disciples, the goal is to keep surrendering to God. The way Matthew Kelly puts it, we want to be 100% available to God, 100% of the time. We have to keep making the decision to drop the nets and follow Jesus. Because as human beings, we're always going to be tempted to drive those nets back at the heart of the Christian experience, what our ancient Christian ancestors called conversion. God is constantly inviting us to conversion. Conversion of the heart is a daily process. There have been several times in my spiritual journey when I have turned to God in a moment of reckless abandon and said, whatever you want, God, everything is yours. I surrender to you completely. I will do whatever you want. With the perspective of time, I've noticed a pattern. I pray this prayer, but then in the coming days, weeks, and months, I take everything back from God, little by little. It happens so gradually that at the time, I often don't even realize I am doing it. I remember praying a prayer of complete surrender once. About 10 minutes later, my brother Brett asked me to borrow my golf clubs. At the time, they were my single most prized possession. I had worked hard to save the money to buy them. I had agonized over buying them, and Brett was a hacker. I felt God smiling and saying, did you really mean what you said, or were they just words? Why do we resist God? Because deep down, we don't trust him. Why do we cast God and his ways aside? Because deep down, we think that God is trying to limit our freedom. Pope Benedict XVI gives us a powerful insight into this behavior. 
the human being does not trust God. Tempted by the serpent, he harbors the suspicion that in the end, God takes something away from his life. That God is a rival who curtails our freedom. And that we will be fully human only when we cast him aside. In brief, we mistakenly believe that only by casting God aside can we fully achieve our freedom. You know, Adam and Eve were given one command. Don't eat the fruit of the one tree. And they decided God was trying to cramp their style. When I first hit that level of intentional discipleship in late 2007, I was given one command. Do pray to saints. For some of you cradle Catholics out there, this may not sound like such a big deal, but for me, oh, it was <laughs> death to self. When God told me that, I prayed to Mary for the first time. I felt her healing, loving presence, and swore that I would never neglect her again. Do you think I kept my promise? <laughs> nope. In early 2008, I took it all back. For the first several months after I became an intentional disciple, I was both awed and terrified at God's new presence in my life. I was Jesus' new baby disciple, and he was giving me spiritual candy all over the place. God had demanded nothing of me at this point, other than that original command, I must pray to saints. At this point in my spiritual journey, I was frequently feeling the presence of God in the saints. God was answering my prayers. The saints were answering my prayers. It was the honeymoon. And on the one hand, it was thrilling, and it filled me with awe. And on the other hand, I worried myself sick, wondering whether I was just making up all these prayer experiences. Maybe it was all wishful thinking. Maybe the answered prayers were just crazy coincidences. I didn't know anyone else who had prayer experiences with the saints. I felt like I was, I mean, not in this on my own, because by then I was feeling like a company of people around me. But uh, I hated not knowing what God was going to do with me next, and I felt like I was in a dangerous place, unexplored territory. So about four months into the great adventure, I announced to God that I would no longer be praying to saints. I was sick of sailing the uncharted waters with God as my guide and the saints at my side. Thank you very much. I was going to go back to the Lutheran church where I felt nice and safe and never leave my comfort zone again. <laughs> <laughs> and after I prayed that, told God, I felt a little empty, but mostly relieved. My life was back in my own hands again. But then, well, what happens when the one sheep leaves the 99? He goes after you. Oh, God goes after you big time. Oh, he's not letting you get away. Right after praying that, an odd thought struck me. Since I didn't know that many Catholic saints, I prayed to many authors of books I read, like Dante and G.K. Chesterton, and it struck me that I had never prayed to C.S. Lewis. And he was the author I'd read the most of. I should thank him. It was God trying to reel me back in, and I fought back. I said, no, I'm done with praying to saints. The impulse to thank C.S. Lewis became so strong, it was nearly overwhelming. I felt as though I would be a horribly ungrateful person if I ignored him. So I gave in, and I prayed a very quick, <coughs> Jack, thank you. I immediately felt his presence with me. I felt wonder and awe. I resisted it mightily. Talk about resistance. I said to him, no, I am done with this. I am sick of being yanked around and having to wonder if any of this is real. C.S. Lewis was very reserved. He did not seem to know what to do with my emotional outburst. He, see, he looked at me for a moment as though wondering, what do I do with her? <laughs> and after thinking about it for a moment, he was gone. I didn't feel his presence anymore. 
Okay, good, he's gone. I felt a little bad for having chased him away and treated him so rudely, but mostly I was relieved. Now I could get back to living a normal life. And then, a moment later, ecstatic joy broke over me like a sucker punch to the gut. The flavor of it was different from anything I'd felt before. As the experience faded, I realized that what I was feeling was one of C.S. Lewis's experiences of joy that he talked about in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. In that book, he talked about how his experiences of joy were pointers to God. They were reactions to what was true and good and beautiful. When we're looking for God, he said, we should follow the joy, we should trust the joy. And right on top of that, bam, another episode came to mind from a different C.S. Lewis book, The Great Divorce, which, by the way, has nothing to do with divorce. The Great Divorce is a marvelous riff on Dante's Divine Comedy. And in this book, a visitor from heaven is trying to convince an apostate arch archbishop whose time is up to come with him to heaven, choose heaven, it's time to go. But the archbishop has decided that none of this can possibly be real. Saints from heaven don't show up in real life. And God, why, he's nothing more than a theological construct. You don't have to obey him. You just have to be a decent person. Follow the spirit of, I'm quoting the book, sweetness and light and service, of course, service. And in the end, the archbishop chooses to stay right where he is. He won't go with the saint. He loses heaven. In short, C.S. Lewis called me to repent and choose God, the saints, and heaven right now. I was so confused and overwhelmed that I did not know what to make of all of this. So I put the pillow over my head and did my best to roll over and go to sleep. But when I woke up in the morning, I realized that my spiritual gift was gone. I did not feel the presence of the saints at all. I didn't really feel the presence of God either. I, I still trusted that God was there, but I didn't feel him either. And at first, it was a relief. I was back in charge of my own life again. It gave me the space to reassess my spiritual life. After I thought it over, I realized what C.S. Lewis had shown me and I realized that I had rejected God's invitation to follow him, and I needed to make things right. So I prayed to God. No response. I prayed to the saints. No response. Worse than no response. It felt like praying to a brick wall. There was absolutely nothing there. This utter silence went on for a couple of weeks. And it showed me very clearly that I had not been making up my spiritual experiences. I couldn't imagine or pretend or muster up any of it. It was just gone. I wanted to do something for God to show him that I realized I had done wrong and was ready to do things his way again. I figured that he was calling me to be Catholic, but I hadn't started going to Mass yet. So. I started going to Mass every Sunday here at St. Francis de Sales. As soon as I walked into the Mass, I felt the loving presence of God. It was like an affectionate, well done, good and faithful servant. But for the rest of the week, when I prayed to him, nothing. When I prayed to the saints, absolutely nothing. After a few weeks, I figured this was the new normal. God was never going to do anything remotely unusual with me again. I had blown it. I started to be a bit sorry that I had turned down his invitation to walking by faith, to supernatural trust. But, funny enough, that led me once again to the point of surrender. At that point, I was ready to accept whatever God had for me, whether that was spiritual fireworks or spiritual desert. Your will be done, Lord. Then one Saturday, I was sweeping the floor, 
Thinking back nostalgically on some of my prayer experiences and remembering what it was like to feel the presence of a saint, and I thought to myself, I miss it. And I heard a very clear reply, well then, you can have it back. Mm -hmm. I felt a rush of wind blow through my chest, and my first thought was, was that real? <laughs> then I went, relax, Kristen. If it was real, you're going to find out soon enough. The next morning at Mass, during the Eucharistic prayer, I saw saints floating in the air above the heads of everyone in the congregation. It was real. It was back. And it was also the first time I ever saw King David, who's the saint I'm closest to right now. And shortly after that, God got serious about my conversion. He started freeing me from habits of sin and changing my life for the better. We think life will be so much better when we're the ones in control. But life's, life God's way is far better than any life we can create for ourselves. So, surrender to God. Do things his way. Try to do better than I did. But when you mess up, surrender to God again. Keep right on going. Any thoughts? Right. Teresa de Avila, she could see it. She I, wasn't I think mystical. so, yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, there are certain people yeah, that, that have those those gifts that kind of... Yeah. You know different, what, though? Different levels. Honestly, if you want those gifts, consider praying for them. Don't expect that God has to say yes. Don't expect that's the only way he works with you or with people. But ask. It can't hurt to ask. I've asked for gifts and had God say yes. I've asked for gifts and had God say no. I just, I like to, uh, you know, read and, and like to say in my morning prayers thing, it's got the saint of the day, you know, all the different ones, and I just kind of read a little thing about them, you know, but you're talking about, you're really getting into reading about the history, you know, a book on that individual saints or something like that. It started out, well, it started out with Dante, where I really got exposed to the saints, was in a medieval history class at the U of A. It was not a Christian environment. It was not a religious studies class. It was a, a straight-up history class. I don't believe the teacher was Catholic. But almost all of our readings for the semester were by saints, because that's who was doing the writing during the Middle Ages. And most of the readings we did were incredible stuff. Uh, we read the life of St. Perpetua, and historically, it's very important. It's the first extant writing by a Christian woman. But it's the most amazing piece of writing. She writes it in jail just before she and her fellow Christians are thrown to the lions. And she tells the story of how God increased their faith, how God reassured them with visions and dreams. That was the first time I read about a person having visions and dreams. And God actually does stuff like that? It started opening my eyes a little. And it made me curious. That's where I was at the time. And after that, we read Augustine. And after that, we read Pope Gregory the Great's Life of St. Benedict. More following God, more miracle stories. And I went, does this stuff, did this stuff happen all throughout Christian history? And we kept going. And we started reading Bernard of Clairvaux. And he has deeply mystical writings. And it was when I read Bernard of Clairvaux that I prayed to God, God, I want to be a Christian like him. Can you make me a Christian like him? Yeah, be careful what you pray for. <laughs> but it just kept going that way, all the way through about a thousand years of history. By the time I got to the end, I was pretty well Catholic. One modern day story everybody's heard, even if you don't know the saints, is St. Jude, of course. Uh-huh. Patriot saint of lost causes. And Danny Thomas, whose real name was Amos Jake Jacobs, his stage name was Danny Thomas, he was like a struggling actor. And he had gone into a church and he had a he was praying that he would get this role that would you know if he got it he knew he'd launch his career and he's paying to saint jude patron saint of lost causes and he got it and the rest is history most people are here too young to remember the day and time i show on tv yeah, yeah. Marlo Thomas <laughs> yeah. and he built saint jude's house he told god that if, if you do this for me i'm going to do he built saint jude's hospital which that's is awesome mm -hmm completely free for, for children who are for suffering cancer and their families. And that's just kind of one of the big first saint stories uh, that, that, that I kind of do. I mean, all of the ones you're talking about, you know, in 
the early saints. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they all have kind of something connected to them mm -hmm. that would uh, make you think, well, maybe you should pray to the saints. Yeah. No, there's a lot to praying to saints, and there's a lot to seeing how the saints pray and going, you know, I, I, I can try that. And that's what kind of got me started. That really kick-started my Catholic conversion big time. And there were some fairly outlandish ways they prayed, too, where I went, oh, that doesn't connect with me. But I was deeply surprised at just how much I did connect with these thousand-year-old Christians. You know, I, I heard that those medieval saints were, you know, mostly crazy people that lived on grass. And no, actually... <laughs> That was St. Francis. That was St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah, no, he was extreme, but he was also extremely awesome. So find out a little bit about the saints that you pray to. Find out how they pray. Pray a written prayer they wrote, something like that. Find out how they pray. Pray, pray along with them. Give it a whirl. All right, made for mission. God sends us out on mission. Just like Jesus sent out 70 disciples, early in his ministry, to heal the sick and cast out demons. We are much better able to go out on mission when we're already intentional disciples. We can still do good things for people before then. But again, think of the example of Peter. Peter could have done good things for Jesus before he decided to follow him. He could have let Jesus have his, have his boat to preach a sermon out of. He could have, you know, helped care for his sick mother-in-law. He could have done lots of things. But he couldn't have had anywhere near the same impact he did when he followed Jesus and started healing the sick and casting out demons. So to be really effective in ministry, the first thing we need to do is seek that deeper conversion. That way, we can go into ministry, into mission, guided by God, empowered by him, ready to go wherever he sends us. Where does God send us? I love the two stories that Matthew Kelly gave. They're so wonderfully counterintuitive. I think we mentioned these the last week, but they're worth mentioning again. He tells the story of the homebound woman in her 70s that wanted to be an evangelist. And she figured out how to do it. She ordered a case of books and sent one out with a personal handwritten letter to everyone she knew and then when that case was done, she ordered a new case. And she started praying, God, who do I send it to? She sent it to a whole, an, an old high school friend. She looked up the friend, sent her the book with a handwritten letter. Three months later, the friend wrote back and said, because of the book you sent me, I'm now back at Mass. I'm now back practicing my faith. And she kept doing it. She sent out one book a day. And this woman is homebound. And she's a real evangelist. It's crazy how God works. It's awesome. And then... There's the, the, the flip side of the coin. Matthew Kelly's talking about people involved with Dynamic Catholic, of course. He said there's one man who was a very successful businessman, and he wanted to be an evangelist. He said, I want to do what you do. I want to quit my day job. But Matthew Kelly asked him to keep discerning, you know, what do you do best? And the man finally realized, after about three years of discernment, no, I'm actually not called to be an evangelist. He said, what I do best is make money. I'm really good at it. He said, I don't know why God gave me this talent. It seems so worldly compared to all the spiritual gifts he could have given me. But he gave me a talent for business and a talent for making money. I'm really good at it. I like it. So how do I serve God? By giving away my money. <laughs> By doing it well. And he said, on top of that, I also teach the confirmation class at church. And that's what I'm called to do. That is my mission. And he was a total peace about it. So, God calls us to ministry sometimes inside the church, but he calls every one of us to ministry of some form or another outside the church. We can be called to care for family, to run a business, all kinds of things. So consider for a moment, where do you believe God is calling you to minister right now? One interesting point here. We often wish we were in a different situation so we could serve God better. Like the woman who wondered how she could be an evangelist when she was homebound. Or the man who wondered why he was in business and what he really wanted to be doing was evangelism. We often wish we were in a different situation. But God calls us to serve him right where we are, in the situation he's placed us in. 
21st century Tucson. He might be calling us to do more than we're doing. He might be. But this is where we start, right here, right now. We don't need to be a different person in a different place with a different job. God calls us to serve him right here. Look at how we can serve him right here. And a few last words from Matthew Kelly. Only by serving others and fulfilling the purpose for which we were created do we find lasting happiness. Don't let the critics get you down. Don't be discouraged. When you face resistance in your mission, in your walk with God, pray and take a tiny step forward in the right direction. Resistance hates action. Don't be afraid to step out in faith and see what God will do. Don't be afraid to let your light shine. You heard that in Mass a couple weeks ago. Matthew Kelly urges us to make ourselves 100% available to God. How available are we to God? 30% available? 70%? 96.2%? It is time for us to stop resisting happiness, to stop resisting the joy of life-giving daily conversion. It is time to stop resisting God. As we pray our closing prayer tonight, let us offer our lives to God. Let us resolve to do His will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Loving Father, I come to you today to make myself 100% available to you. I lay everything I have and everything I am at your feet. Take what you want to take and give what you want to give. Command me in all things. I will do whatever you ask me to do. To transform me and to transform my life so that I may become the very best version of myself and be yours to you with my life and my love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our homework for the foreseeable future <laughs> is to keep giving our lives to God over and over again. Because like any good habit, it gets easier. Thank you so much for coming, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.